The makers of Campbell Soups present the Campbell Playhouse. Orson Welles, producer. This is Ernest Chappell speaking. Tonight, the Campbell Playhouse presents Orson Welles in his own radio version of Counselor at Law. Heading the cast are Aline McMahon of the theater in Hollywood and Gertrude Berg, who leaves her role as Molly Goldberg on her own program, The Rise of the Goldbergs, to appear on another broadcast for the first time. Let me ask what comes to your mind when I mention chicken for dinner. (laughs) I think I know. You visualize a fine, plump chicken sizzling brown and falling into tender slices under the touch of the carving knife. And you recall the eager anticipation as the plates were passed from place to place. A grand dish, chicken. A special occasion treat that's always welcome. But remember that between these special occasions, your family can still enjoy the good taste of chicken soup. Because just as sure as you like chicken, you like Campbell's chicken soup. You'll see how chicken-rich it is and the very golden glisten of it. You'll taste deep-down chicken flavor in every tempting spoonful. What's more, you'll find pieces of tender chicken meat in it and fluffy, snowy rice. I know you'll agree that Campbell's is the real old-fashioned kind of chicken soup. Why not keep several cans of Campbell's chicken soup on hand? Good evening, this is Orson Welles. The Campbell Playhouse, as I've already mentioned, is a radio show and not a broadcast from the stage. Our stories are addressed to you in your homes and not to an audience that we can see. And only on special occasions are inhabitants of the outside world admitted to the mysterious privacy of the studio from which these words are originating. Tonight is such an occasion. But tonight our story is about courtrooms and judges, laws and lawyers, and nobody knows less about these things than I do. And nobody knows more than my good friend, Mr. Samuel S. Leibowitz, who has been kind enough to come up here and check my script for inaccuracies and to advise me on points of legal procedure. Under the circumstances, the least I could do was to ask him to stay for the broadcast. For Mr. Leibowitz, as everybody knows who can spell out a headline, has been prominent in more celebrated trials than you could shake a docket at. It is hardly necessary to remind you of the Irwin case, the Vera Stretz case, the Scottsboro trial the breadknife murderess, the mother on a slayer, the vendetta woman, or the gigolo murder. With this enviable and unprecedented career behind him, I am fairly sure that Mr. Leibowitz examined my case very thoroughly before he took it on. I can hardly hope that he will defend my performance of counselor at law. I can only hope that our broadcast will not detract from his record. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present counselor at law's counselor at law, my legal advisor for tonight, Mr. Samuel S. Leibowitz. Thank you, Orson. I'm very curious to see what you're going to do with one of my favorite plays. As you know, the original author, Elmer Rice, was a law student. So his legal details are mostly authentic. As far as I can see, there's nothing in your script that would be ruled out of court. I hope you're right, Sam. And I hope you like our show. And now, if you'll just sit over there with Mrs. Leibowitz and pretend you're the jury... Aline McMahon, Gertrude Berg, and the rest of us of the Campbell Playhouse will present our case to you, and I promise you we'll all be very interested to hear your verdict. Ladies and gentlemen, and Mr. and Mrs. Leibowitz, the Campbell Playhouse presents Counselor at Law by Elmer Rice and remains obediently yours. Yes. 
Yes, I'll put you through. Hello? Simon and Tedesco. Who is calling, please? Mr. McKee. Mr. McGee? No, Mr. McKee. Mr. McKee, Taylight and Kitty? That's right, of Bartlett, Bartlett, McKee. One moment, please. Mr. McKee of Bartlett, Bartlett, McKee calling Mr. Tedesco. Oh, Henry. Yeah, what is it? Hey, Henry, will you distribute this mail? Oh, gee, I gotta get out these notices at trial. Can't you even sort it? Say, hey, who's the office boy around here? You or me? Oh. Simon and Tedesco. Hey, One moment, please. Hello? Simon and Tedesco. Hiya, Bessie. Mr. Little Oh, so it's you, is it? I thought you was dead and buried. Did you wear mourning? No, I don't look so good in black. You missed me, babe? Yeah, sure, I missed you. Did you, Bessie? Yeah, like Booth missed Lincoln. Gee, I'm glad I'm wearing long sleeves so I can laugh in them. Uh, you go for me, Betsy. You know you do. All right, now I'll tell you one. Wait a minute. Simon and Tedesco. Yes, Simon, yes who's calling? Wilson and Devore. One moment. I'll give you Miss Gordon, his secretary. Wilson and Devore calling Mr. Simon. Here's Miss Gordon, Mr. Simon's secretary. All righty, go ahead. Hello. I'm still waiting. Yeah, you had another call. Well, here's your chance, babe. Me out tonight. I can't tonight. Say, you must have your hats made in a barrel factory. You better call me back later. I'm busy now. Hello? Simon and Tedesco. One moment, please. Excuse me, please. Who did you wish to see, madam? Is Mr. Simon busy, please? Yes, he is. Would anybody else do? I'll wait for him. Well, he may be busy for quite a while. Oh, that's all right. I got plenty of time. All right, take a seat. Thank you. Hello? Simon and Tedesco. Who's calling Mr. Simon? I'll put you through to Miss Gordon's secretary. Bessie! Bessie! Tongue on Ryan Chocolate Mountain. Oh, thanks, Charlie. Thirty cents and here's your change. Did you tell him to put a lot of Russian dressing on it? Yeah, smeared it on six. Simon and Tedesco. Hello? And this is Bellini. Mr. Bellini? Now. Yes, you can have Mr. Tedesco now. Mr. Bellini's calling Mr. Tedesco. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah? What is it, please? Ain't you Mr. Simon's mother? Sure, I'm, I'm Lena Simon. I thought I recognized you. I guess you don't remember me. Well, uh, I think I saw you somewhere before. I'm Charlie McFadden. Used to be the helper to Barney O'Rourke, the plumber on 3rd Avenue. When you and your old man had the bakery shop and George was selling papers. Oh, sure. Sure, of course, sure. Then we lived on 86th Street. Yeah. I'll say you're looking great. (laughs) Well, you don't look a day older than the last time I saw you. Well, uh, I have my health, thank God. My boy gives me everything, <laughs> more than I want. Why shouldn't I look well? Well, you sure got reason to be proud of your son, Mrs. Simon. He's a prince among men, that's what he is. Yes, that's just what he is, Mr. McFadden. Well, he gave me a new start in life, that's what he did. You know, I was, I was nothing but a jailbird. You're uh, working here for uh, Georgie? Yeah, nearly four years now. Hmm. Process server. Now and again, I do a little private detective work for Mr. Simon, uh, you see, I got ways of finding things out. Mm, he's a good, good man, my Georgie. He always worked hard. Since he was a little boy, he's working hard. Always working and studying and trying to better himself. You sure? <laughs> That's how he made his success? Well, I'll tell you yes you're here, Mrs. Simon. No, Mr. McFadden. I'll sit and wait for Georgie. It's all right. He's so busy and I have all day. <laughs> Hello? Simon and Pietro. Who's calling? Good morning, everybody. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Chapman. Good morning, Bessie. Well, congratulations, Mrs. Chapman. Thanks, Charlie. Well, you sure must be feeling good this morning, Mrs. Chapman. <laughs> I feel just like a new woman. That's how I feel. Yeah, I'll bet you do. After all, you've been through. Of course, after Mr. Simon talked to the jury, I had a feeling that everything was going to be all right. Why, do you know I just sat there and cried like a baby? And when the acquittal came... Would you believe it? I was out like a light. Oh, gee, I wish I could have heard Mr. Simon speak. Uh, Bessie, will you tell him I'm here? Yeah. I feel well. Oh, Miss Gordon, Mrs. Chapman's in the office to see Mr. Simon. All righty, I'll tell her. Mr. Simon's on long distance. Miss Gordon says he will please take a seat and wait a minute, Mr. Chapman. Okay, I hope you don't make it too long. Simon and Tedesco. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Simon. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Simon. Oh, uh, Mr. Simon, he's on long distance just now, ma'am. Well, Miss Gordon is talking on another wire. Do you want to hold on? No, I'll call later. All right, Mrs. Simon. I'll tell him you called. Goodbye. <laughs> that was Mrs. Simon. Does she come around here a lot? Oh, well, not so much. They live up in Westchester. Yeah. She's one of the 400, you know. Her father was the governor of some state. Hmm. Kind of ritzy, huh? Well, you know the way those society dames are. Sure. They never wear the same dress twice. And... 
Yes, Miss Gordon. Mr. Simon will see Mrs. Chapman now. He asked her to step in. All righty. You can go right in now, Mrs. Chapman. You know the way? Yes, I know the way. Close the door. Hello, George, darling. Sit down. Thank you, George. Pretty busy, Zadora. What's on your mind? Anything special? I got clients waiting for me. Oh, well, let them wait. George, darling, how can I ever thank you enough? You thanked me last night. It's my business to tell people when they get into trouble. And hereafter, don't keep any firearms around the house. It might turn out so well next time, you know. Oh, George, you were so wonderful when you talked to the jury. All those beautiful things you said about me. See, it made me feel that you were the first man that ever really understood me. Well, anyhow, I understand juries. It's very nice of you to come in, Zadora. Any time I can be of any further use to you. Why are you so cold to me, George? Don't you know how fond I am of you? Oh, George, dear, I've learned to grow so fond of you. and I realize you're a married listen, man. Listen, listen, Mrs. Chapman. I was engaged to defend you on the charge of murdering your husband. There's nothing in the retainer that requires me to fall in love with you. Well, of all the darn nerves. There's a way out, Mrs. Chapman. Come Are on. Are you throwing me out of your office? That's what it looks like. You go to the devil. Goodbye, Mrs. Chapman. I'm going to pay for this. Say, Bessie, if that woman comes in or calls me, I'm out. You understand? Yes, Mr. Simon. They'll help me. That's the last of those female murder cases I'll ever handle. Hello, Georgie. Mama. Mama, I didn't know you were here. That's all right, Georgie. How are you? Have you been here long? <laughs> Bessie, why didn't you tell me my mother was here? Only a few minutes, Georgie. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Simon. I didn't know the lady was your mother. What do you mean you didn't know? Don't you ask people who they are when they come in? Georgie, please. I, I got plenty of time. The next time my mother calls, I want her announced right away, no matter who's in the office. Do you understand? Yes, Mr. Simon. Come in the office, Mama. Have you lunch? Sure, sure. <laughs> Long time already. <laughs> sit down, sit down, Mama. Make yourself comfortable. Well, Mama, I decided to go to Europe with Cora next week. That's good, Georgie. That's good. You, you, you need a good rest. You work too hard. I don't need any rest, but... Well, hard work's good for me, Mama, but I promised Cora that we'd celebrate our fifth anniversary by taking a trip together. You know, I haven't really had a chance to be alone with Cora much. Mm, that's what you should do, Georgie. A man and his wife should be just as close together as possible. Yeah, especially when a man has a wife like Cora. She's a wonderful, wonderful woman, Mama. Well, she has a good husband in you, too, Georgie. Oh, yes, of course. According to you, nobody would be good enough for me. It's one of the king of England never asked me to become his son-in-law. Well, I'm sure his daughters couldn't do any better. <laughs> oh, Mommy, you're a sweetheart. <laughs> All right, last, last. <laughs> My opinion, you don't change. <laughs> Georgie, <laughs> I, I want to talk to you. Is there anything wrong? You're feeling all right? Oh, I'm feeling fine. About me, you mustn't worry, Georgie. Well, what's the matter, then? What do you look so serious about? Georgie, you... You mustn't be angry. I'm not going to be angry. What is it? Uh, Georgie, um... Your... Your brother David called me up this morning. Well? He told me you wouldn't be angry. I'm not angry, Mama. Go ahead. He... He needs a little money. Money? What does he need money for this time? Check came back from the bank. You mean he gave somebody a bum check? He made a little mistake in his balance. That's definitely made a little mistake in his balance. He's a crook, that's what he is. George, is that a way to talk about your brother? Yes, brother. A fine brother he is. But I'm through with him. He can get himself out of this one. George, be a good boy. It's the last time. He, he won't do it again. Yes. How many times have I heard that one before? I'm through with him, I tell you. I'm supposed to be an important lawyer around here. I'm mixed up in more front-page cases than any lawyer in New York. People from whole families come in and think I'm doing him a favor if I accept their retainers. If I don't happen to like a millionaire's looks, I throw him out of the office. Yeah, it's fine for me, isn't it, to have a brother going around getting himself pinched in gambling raids and handing out rubber checks. It's great, isn't it? George, please. For me, do it. Not for him. Oh, no. I, I don't always ask you for something, George. All right, then, Mama. Put it that way. Rexy, you come in? Thanks, Georgie. You're a good boy. Yes, Mr. Simon. Oh, Oh, hello, Mrs. Simon. How are you? Can't complain. Thank you, Miss Gordon. Rexy, make out a check. My brother for... Uh, how much is it, Mama? Uh, $450. $450. Cash for the mail tonight. Yes, Mr. Simon. Oh, uh, Pete Malone from the county clerk's office is outside. He says it's important. A few minutes. Can't be that important. He can wait. Yes, sir. A nice girl, George. That's Miss Gordon. Yeah, she's a wonderful secretary. Couldn't get along without her. How is it such a nice girl like Miss Gordon don't, don't find us of a husband? I don't know. I think she's interested in men. Well, Georgia, I see you're busy. And I think I'll go home now. All right, Mama. Take a taxi up. Oh, 
bus is all right, too. The bus is good enough. And uh, thank you, Georgie, for for David. And from now on, I'm sure he'll be a good boy, like you. And every night, George, I, I say a prayer for you and for him. Goodbye, Mama. Goodbye, Georgie. Take care of yourself. Goodbye. Rexy! Yes, Mr. son? Rexy, how much did I tell you to send a bill to Mrs. Richter for? Oh, uh, 5000 I better make it six and send it to her as soon as the separation agreement is signed. I wanted to get it while she's still grateful. Yes, sir. Oh, and Mr. Simon. Yeah, what is it? Motion to dismiss Palin against White National comes up this morning. Getting adjournment. And uh, here's a money order for $50 for Mrs. Moran in that accident case. Send it back. She can't afford to send me $50. What? Hello, Mr. Simon's office. Miss Gordon speaking. What is it now? With Mrs. Simon. Oh. Hello, darling. How are you? How are you, dear? I'm fine. I had a hard time getting you. Yeah, I was talking to Washington. You didn't get home last night? No, no, the, the jury didn't come in until after midnight, and by the time I got it out, it was nearly two. George? Yeah? Did you check on the reservation? Oh, yes, darling, on the, on the Paris. Say, why don't you have lunch with me? I have a date. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. No, that's all right, darling. I, I, I'll see you this afternoon, around three. Right. Goodbye, sweetheart. All right, anything else? Well, Pete Malone's still waiting to see you. Oh, and there's a wire from Washington. I don't understand it. All it says is yes, and it's signed X, Y, Z. Let's see it. Well, get Joe Fisherman of Fisherman and Company right away. Come to buy 5,000 shares of Gulf Coast Utilities in the market. But, Mr. Simon, you said only last week. I know that... it's a lousy start, but that wire's a hot tip. The court's going to dismiss the complaint against the company, and the stock's due for a little while. Go on, hurry. What are you waiting for? Do what I tell you. Send him Pete Malone. Yes, Mr. Simon. Bessie. Yes, Miss Gordon. Mr. Simon will see Mr. Malone. Yes, Mr. Gordon. Oh, and Mr. Simon, before you go out, Mr. Tedesco would like to have a word all with right, you. All right, all right. Come in. Hello, George. Oh, what's on your mind, Malone? Plenty, George. I'm afraid it's not good news. Sit down, fill it. You know my brother Ed, the warden up at Elmhurst? Sure I know him. He's getting along up there. Oh, he's getting along all right. But he tipped me off to something I think you ought to know. All right. Do you ever remember handling a case for some fellow named, uh... Oh, wait a minute till I think of his name. It's some Dutch or Hebrew name, something other Stein. Uh, wait, I, I think I wrote it down somewhere. Uh, yes, uh, here it is. Uh, Breitstein. Johann Breitstein. Remember him? Yeah, I remember. Johann Breitstein, a German boy. I defended him on a larceny charge about eight or nine years ago and got him acquittal. What about it? Was there something about an alibi? Yeah, he had an airtight alibi. That's why the jury acquitted him. Yeah, well, it seems there was another guy who was mixed up in the case. Is that right? Yes, he established the alibi for Breitstein. That's it. Well, this bird's doing a stretch up at Elmhurst, and it seems he had a session with a friend of yours who's a member of the parole board. What are you talking about? A man by the name of Francis Clark Baird. Ever hear him? Yes. Well, what about him? Well, this bird's been giving Francis Clark Baird some song and dance about that alibi being framed up. What do you mean, framed up? Well, I'm just telling you what Ed told me over the phone last night. This guy Baird on the grievance committee of the Bar Association, too? Yes, sir. I think so. Well, that's what Ed said. He says he's got a hunch that Francis Clark Baird would like to get something on you, George. I guess that's right, too, ain't it? Yeah, sure he would. I licked him to a fair you well in half a dozen cases. Well, that's what I said to Ed. There's nothing to it, Ed, I says. George is too smart a boy, I says, to let himself get mixed up with anything like that. Only I thought I'd better tip you off. Thanks, Pete. It was well of you to let me know. Hey, what do you think of those silk stockings trying to pull a thing like that on me? Ah, uh, well, you know how it is, George. These guys that came over on the Mayfly don't like to see the boys on 2nd Avenue sitting in the high places. We're just a lot of riffraff to them. Yeah. Rexy, come in, please. Uh, well, uh, i got to be getting back to the office. So long, George. Come around the club some night. Yes, I will, Pete. Thanks for the steer. Keep the chain. So long. So long, Pete. Yes, Mr. Simon? Listen, Rexy, i got a job for you. It's important. Yes, sir. About eight or nine years ago, I defended a fellow named Johann Breitstein in General Sessions. I want you to get a hold of Breitstein right away. Let everything else go until you locate him, understand? Yes, it certainly will. And get me all the papers out of the files and have them here for me this afternoon. People against Johann Breitstein. Then sent up to General Sessions and order a transcript of the stenographer's minutes of the trial and locate Breitstein. And uh, ask Mr. Tedesco to step in here right away, and I don't want to be disturbed. Yes, Mr. Simon. Okay. Yes, Mr. Simon. Is uh, Charlie McFadden out there? He's gone to the bank. All right. Get a hold of him as soon as he gets in. I want to see him. Hello, John. What is it, George? You want to see me? John, you're my partner. Got a right to know this before anyone else. Did you ever hear of Francis Clark Baird? Bad? Yes, I heard of him. Hmm. He's got something on me, and he's going to break me. What do you mean, he's got something on you? Well, you think I'm crazy when you hear this. Maybe you're right. I once helped the fellow out of a jam by putting over a fake alibi. Subordination of perjury? Yeah, that's right. They 
can't get me on a criminal charge. The statute of limitations is run, but they can disbar me, and they will. Disbar you? That's what I said. George, how did you ever get yourself mixed up in anything like oh, that? Oh, don't ask me. I was just a fool, that's all. I'll tell you how it happened. Nine years ago, a kid by the name of Brightstein had stolen $12 out of a locker in a bathhouse. Well, I advised him to plead guilty and get off the few bunts. Then I discovered that he was a fourth offender and that a conviction meant a life sentence. Well, I didn't know what to do about it, so finally, Brightstein said he could get a fellow to swear that he was in his house in Jamaica the day the robbery was committed. I couldn't refuse, John. I'd known the kid and his family. I knew he'd go straight if I got him off, and he has, too. I just couldn't get to see that kid get a life sentence, so... Like a sucker, I went into it. Now the chickens are coming home to roost. But, uh, has this fellow Bradstein been squealed? No, the guy that fixed the alibi's been talking, making a play for parole. And, of course, Francis Clark did has to be on the parole board. It's funny, in a way. For years, that Yankee's been trying to get something on me. Every time he's drawn a blank, and now this one thing that was dead and buried and forgotten falls right into his lap, and it's... It's good as if I'd misappropriated a million dollars. Well, can't you bluff it through, George? Oh, maybe yes, maybe no. Trouble is that the case won't bear any investigating. Oh, good Lord. What am I going to do, John? They're going to disbar me, sure as fate. It's rich, isn't it? I guess there's not much use going to Francis Clark bad with the whole story. That's a laugh, John. Might as well throw a biscuit into a cage of a man-eating tiger. Well, I know some ways that you could get him that would put an end to his funny business forever. John, listen, we're a long way from Sicily, boy. Put it out of your mind. You'll make me sorry that I told you in a minute. Well, what good is a rat like that? He's out after our scouts, isn't he? And why? Because we came from the streets and our parents talk with an accent. Oh, what's the good of talking about all that? He's technically right and he's doing his duty. Well, you're not licked yet, George. We'll pull all the wires we can. Thanks, John. I know I can count on you to the last drop of blood. One bright spot in the picture. Got you and one or two other friends that'll stick to the finish. And a wife that's 100%. That makes it worth fighting. That's the boy. You know, maybe I'm building this thing bigger than it really is. See how it works out. I just wanted you to know about it, John, that's all. Yes? What is it? Harry McFadden's coming, Mr. Simon. Send him in right away. Well, uh, I guess I'll be going, George. I'll see you later. Come in, Charlie. All right, John, I'll give you a call when I come back for lunch. Thanks. All right, George. Keep your chin up. Okay, John. Thanks. You want to see me, Chief? Yeah, Charlie. Sit down. Listen, Charlie. Something I'd like you to do for me. It's pretty important. Okay, Chief. There's a lawyer by the name of Francis Clark Baird. Sure, I know him. He's right across the street in the French building. Yeah. What I'd like you to do, Charlie, is to see what you can find out about him. You want him shattered, is that it? Yeah. Well, Rexy, hey, come in, please. Yes, Mr. Simon. Yeah, Charlie. I, I want you to I want you to know how he spends his time and who his friends are and where he goes nights. I get you. I don't suppose it'll do much good, but you might try. Huh, leave it to me, Chief. I got lots of ways of finding things out. Yes, Mr. Simon. Listen, Rexy. Uh, all right, Charlie. Thanks a lot. Hold so on, boss. Rexy, did you locate Brightstein? Well, I found out where he works. He's out on a job, and we're trying to get him. Well, have him come to the office the minute you find him. All right. I've got to go to court now on that Wheelock case, so I'll be back in an hour. And you better get something to eat. I'm not hungry. Oh, Mr. Simon. Yes, Rexy, what is it? Oh, Mr. Simon, is there anything wrong? Oh, there is, isn't there? Of course not. Why is there anything wrong? Well, because if there were anything that I could do, Mr. Simon... Now you can mind your own business. That's what you can do. Bessie, drink this. What is it? Well, it's just some bromides to quiet your nerves. Now, go on, drink it. Does it taste bad, Miss Gordon? Oh, no, no, it's nothing at all. Go on, take it. It'll make you feel better. I hate taking stuff. And what'll Mr. Simon say if he comes in and finds me laying on his couch? No, I'll take care of that. And if you don't feel better, I'm going to send you home in a taxi. Oh, no, I don't want to go home. Honest, I don't, Miss Gordon. I really don't. I always stop thinking if I go home. Oh, are you sure? Yeah, I'll be back in a... I think I'll, I'll be all right in a minute. I think I'll go back to the switchboard. Oh, gee, here's Mr. Simon coming now. I better scream. What's the matter? Anything wrong? Well, it's nothing, but Bessie had a little shock just now, and it upset her. She's all right again. You better jump in the cab, Bessie, and go home. Oh, no, I'm all right again, Mr. Simon. Honest, I am. I'm going back to the board right now. Well, listen, if you're not feeling all right, I want you to go home. Oh, oh I'm all right, Mr. Simon. Thanks ever so much, Mr. Gordon. Hey, what's the matter with her? I saw somebody jump out of the window of an office building, and it gave her a bad shock. Gee, that's awful. Where was it? Well, I don't exactly know where. It was somewhere on Fifth Avenue. Imagine a fellow doing a thing like that. Well, I suppose if you're tired of living, it's as good a way as any to end it. What, jumping out of a window like that? Well, why not? A few seconds and it's all over. 
I guess people don't do it unless they have a pretty good reason. What the devil are you so morbid about? I'm not morbid. Only we don't ask to be brought into this world, and if we feel like leaving it, I don't see that it's anybody's business but our own. What's the matter? Don't you feel well or something? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Just talking a lot of nonsense, that's all. Good. Right, Tanya? Yes, sir. He's waiting outside. See him right away. Wait a minute. See if you can get me Francis Clark Baird. No, I'll try him again. Bessie, try Mr. Baird again at his office. Anything important in the mail? Well, a check came in from the Murray Packing Company. How much? 10000 plus 200 and some odd dollars for disbursement. I forget the actual amount. Oh, hello. Sorry, Mr. Baird isn't in. Oh, I see. Thank you. Now, Mr. Baird isn't in. Oh, when's he expected? Wait a minute. Is that his secretary? Yes, sir. I'll talk to him myself. Hello? Is this Mr. Baird's secretary? Uh, yes, sir. Is, is this Mr. Simon speaking? Mr. George Simon. Do you know when Mr. Baird will be in? I'm sorry. He didn't say. Oh, I, I see. Well, do you know where he can be reached? Uh, no, Well, he's no, in town, I... isn't he? I couldn't say. Do you think you're, you're likely to hear from him during the day? I... Yes, it's all pretty indefinite, isn't it? Well, okay, if you do hear from him, will you tell him that I called and asked him if he'll be good enough to call me? Yes, Mr. Simon. Yeah, thank you very much. Goodbye. I think that Baird could afford to employ a more convincing liar than that. All right, I'll see Brightstein now. Okay. Yes, Miss Gordon. Mr. Simon, we'll see Mr. Brightstein now. Yes, Miss Gordon. All right, and I don't want to be disturbed. Plan any engagements? You've a date at 3.30 with Mr. Laporte. Yes, I must keep that. I'll put off all the others. Oh, Mr. Brightstein, would you come right in? Come right in, Brightstein. Sit down. Rexy, see that I'm not disturbed, will you? Yes, sir. Oh, Brightstein, glad to see you again. I'm very glad to see you, Mr. Simon. How have you been? Oh, I've been fine, Mr. Simon. I got a good job now. You have? What are you doing? I'm assistant cameraman for General Newsreel. Oh, that's so? That's yeah. great. Listen, Brightstein, has anybody been talking to you lately about that case of yours? Well, no, Mr. Simon, they haven't. Nobody's approached you or asked you any questions? No, sir. Why? Well, it seems the fellow that fixed that alibi of yours has been doing some talking. Holy Moses, Mr. Simon. Does that mean that they're going to come after me again? Yes, they're likely to. Oh, holy smug, Mr. Simon. What am I going to do? Well, don't get excited anyway, Brightstone. I think maybe everything will be all right. You do just what I tell you. Well, sure I will, Mr. Simon. Gee whiz, I've got a wife and family. Now, I don't know what I'll do if anything. What you've got to do is to stick by that alibi story. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah sure, Mr. Simon. Whatever you say. Gosh, Mr. Simon, everything i got, I owe to you. Jimmy, if it wasn't for you, I'd, I'd be in for life. I'd go through fire and water. All right, Bryce. All right, thanks. Just keep all this under your hat. If anybody questions you, just stick to your story and act dumb. Hey, you betcha. You think everything's going to be all right, Mr. Simon? Well, I hope it is. Why, don't you? Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, just thinking. What? Well, I was thinking in case they should look up the hospital records. What hospital records? Well, the hospital records of this fellow that fixed the alibi. What are you talking about? Well... You know, the day it happened, the day he said I was in his house. Well, he was in the hospital. You mean to say that the day you robbed the bathhouse, this man was in the hospital? Yeah, he used to have fits, and they took him to the hospital. Holy. Okay, are you sure of this, Bryce Stein? Oh, yeah, sure. That's why I had to pay him $200 to testify. He was afraid they'd find out about him being in the hospital that day. I thought you knew all about him, Mr. Simon. First I ever heard of him. Oh, gee, I hope everything's going to be all right. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> what is it, Rexy? Um, well, uh... Goodbye. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Simon. Goodbye, Bryce Stein. You, um... Yes, Rexy, what is it? You rang. Yeah, did I? I rang? Mm hmm. Oh, I forgot what I wanted. Oh. Yes? Yes, Rexy? Mr. Simon is here. Oh, uh, ask her to come right in. I don't want to be disturbed, Rexy, no matter what it is. Yes, sir. And keep trying to get there. Try him at his club. Yes, Mr. Simon. Hello, darling. Hello, George. You're looking wonderful. Oh, oh what is it, George? You were so mysterious on the phone. Well, darling, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. European trip is off. I know it's a big disappointment to you, and I never in my life look forward to so much. Something has come up. I can't get away. But you were so certain only yesterday that nothing could keep you from going. What is it? Another $100,000 fee? Oh, I, I wouldn't have called off our honeymoon, darling, for a retainer from the United States Steel Corporation. But it's not business, detaining you? Well, it is and it isn't, yeah. I don't know just how to tell you. Well, tell me, George, what it is. It doesn't help matters to pile up the suspense. No, I guess you're right. Well, darling, I'm in trouble. The worst trouble I've been in my whole life. Well, tell me. Well, I'm threatened with disbarment. Oh. Oh, how, how perfectly ghastly. Yeah, I knew it would shock you. And it's been a shock to me, I can tell you. I don't understand it. Disbarment? Why, I thought... that Doesn't disbarment imply... Yes, it does more than imply establishes that a man is guilty of conduct which makes him unworthy to practice his profession. That's what I'm faced with this very minute. Then, I mean, I... 
I'm quite bewildered. Eighteen years. Eighteen years. I've been a full-fledged lawyer. Eighteen years. Nobody's ever had anything on me. And then this, this one thing, this one little thing that was dead and buried comes up. And... Thing. How'd I go like a candle? What was it that you did, George? You know what it means to frame up on an alibi? Yes, I think I do. Getting someone to testify falsely. I, I don't know much about these things, George. Wasn't that a dishonest thing to do? Well, it was conniving at a lie to save a poor kid from going to prison for life to prevent a conviction that nobody wanted, not the judge, nor the district attorney, nor the jury, but that the law made inevitable. But why do you have anything to do with such people? Thieves, criminals? Well, I'm a lawyer, darling. Somebody's got to defend people who are accused of crime. Was this boy guilty? Guilty of stealing a few dollars, yes. And now someone's found out about the alibi and they're going to disbar you. Is that it? Yes, someone's found out. A man who's had it in for me for years. A gentleman by the name of Francis Clark Baird. Francis Clark Baird? Why, he's a very eminent lawyer, isn't he? I think I've heard Father speak of him. Isn't he one of the Connecticut Baird? Yes, he may be, for all I know, but that doesn't mean much to me. All that I know is that he's got the dope on me and he's going to make me pay through the nose. Why do you always put things on a personal basis, George? Isn't it the duty of a man like Mr. Baird? No or... man has to break another man unless he wants to. Now, darling, you're not siding with Baird, are you? I really don't know what to say, George. It's most distressing. I know how you've had to struggle and it's all very admirable, but it's made it possible for you to accept things that are rather difficult for me to accept. Well, what things, darling? Oh, I don't know. There's something distasteful about the whole atmosphere of the thing. This association with thieves and perjurers. And now this scandal. It will be a scandal, I'm sure. Newspaper publicity and all that. I'll try to spare you all I can, darling. Now, what are my friends going to say? How am I going to face them? Do they mean more to you than I do? That isn't the point. The best thing for me to do is to go to Europe on Tuesday as I'd planned. If this thing blows over, and let's hope it will, you can join me abroad later. If it doesn't, well... There's time enough to think about that. You mean you're going to walk out on me? Well, that's a very crude way of putting it, George. And very unfair to me, too. It isn't as though I could do anything for you. I could, I'd, I'd be glad to stay, but you've said yourself there isn't anything now, haven't you? Yes, I guess I did. Just that at a time like this, I, I thought I'd like to have you around, that's all. Isn't that just a little selfish, George? Yes, I guess you're right. I guess it is selfish. I hadn't looked at it in that way. I just thought... I just thought, Cora, that maybe you'd want to stay. Oh, please don't misunderstand me, George. Please don't think I'm unsympathetic. Would you like me to ask Father to intercede with Mr. Bailey? No, I don't think you'd better do that. Well, whatever you say. I do hope everything will turn out for the best. Oh, well, I've really got to run now. I'm late as it is. I'm meeting Roy Darwin for cocktails at 21. Who? Roy Darwin. Oh, uh, George... Will you be coming out to the country tonight? Well, I don't know whether I'll be able to make it or not. I'll phone you if I can. Yes, do. Au revoir, George. I do hope everything's going to be all right. Goodbye, sweetheart. Here, you can go out this way. Don't bother. I know the way. Rexy. Any luck with that bed call? No, I called his club. They said he wasn't there. Sure they did. Hello, who it is, and he's ducking. Mr. Simon, it's time for you to leave for your luncheon appointment with Mr. Laporte. What? Oh, oh, yes. Is it time to leave? Yes, sir. All right. So, you know, Rexy, maybe that guy wasn't so crazy after all. What do you mean, Mr. Simon? The one that jumped out of that window. Maybe he's better off that way. Troubles are over. But I, what you I know I did. Maybe I was wrong. What's the matter? Nothing. What are you crying about? I'm not crying. It's nothing. Nothing at all. What's the matter with you lately? Nothing's the matter with me. Don't you feel well? Yes, yes, of course. Well, maybe you've been working too. I'm... Maybe you ought to have a little vacation, huh? No, no, I don't want any vacation. Well, maybe I'll be going away myself soon, then you get a good rest. I don't want a rest. I'll get a cab for you now. Never mind, I'll find one. If anyone calls me, I'll be back in an hour and, and uh, get me a reservation on the 4 o'clock plane to Washington. Yes, Mr. Simon. <laughs> In just a moment, we will continue our Campbell Playhouse presentation of Counselor at Law.
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Ernest Chappell speaking. We welcome you back to the Campbell Playhouse presentation of Counselor at Law, starring Orson Welles, Aline McMahon, and Gertrude Berg. This is, frankly, an interruption, but a very brief one. In our first performances of the new year, we wish to thank you for your ever-increasing use of Campbell's soups, which make these programs possible. Last year, 1938, you bought more Campbell's soups than in any previous year in our history. Naturally, we appreciate it. In these Campbell Playhouse programs, we are making our talks about soup quite short so that they'll not interfere with your enjoyment. From time to time, we shall suggest that you try a certain soup that may be new to you or one that you're not using often. All we ask you to do is to try these various Campbell soups and see for yourself how good they are. We now bring you the second half of Counsel at Law, starring Orson Welles, Aline McMahon, and Gertrude Berg. Simon and Desco. Mr. Tedesco, who is calling, please? I'll give you Mr. Tedesco. One moment, please. Mr. Simon, please. Mr. Simon's out of town. It's almost five now. You better call back in the morning. I don't All righty. Simon and Desco. Well, I'll give you Miss Gordon, his secretary. One moment, please. Simon and Desco. Hello. Yes, this is Mr. Simon's office. Miss Gordon speaking. No, I'm awfully sorry. Mr. Simon's out of town. He left last night. I... Well, tell him to call. Oh, yes, I'll tell him. Hello. This is Mr. Simon's office. Oh, oh no, Mrs. Simon. No, he's not returned from Washington yet. Are you at the pier now? No, I'm leaving in a few minutes. Well, of course, he might have gone from the airport to the pier. How soon will you be at the pier? In about half an hour. If I don't, say goodbye. I hope you will do. All right, I will. I hope you have a pleasant trip, Mrs. Simon. Thank you. I hope you fall overboard, Mrs. Simon. Yes, isn't back yet? No, Mr. Tedesco. Uh, it's almost five. I think he may have gone right to the French line here. Mrs. Simon's boat sails at six for Paris. Oh, I forgot to send out a telegram. You want me to take care of it for you? Yes, if you don't mind. All right, I'll send it right away. Hello, John. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Simon. Hello, Rexy. Well, Mr. Simon, your wife just called up. Yeah? I'll call up the pier. No, never mind. I'll go down there in a few minutes. Have a taxi ready for me in about 15 minutes. Yes, sir. Would oh, you arrange about the books and flowers? Yes, sir. Uh, you know, fresh flowers every day. Yes. Do they undertake that? Yes, is that all? Yeah, that's all. Well, John, Pete Malone and I just got back from Washington. Well? Might just as well have saved ourselves a trip. What did he say? Oh, he handed out the usual line of bull about what a great guy I am, how he loves me like a brother, about what a tough break it is that this thing has to come up. Yes, well, is he going to do something about it? Not a thing. Pete tried to get him to make a personal appeal to Baird, but it wasn't a bit of use. Oh, the yellow rat. Why didn't you tell him that if it hadn't been for you, he never would have got the nomination? Oh, what's the use? He doesn't know it already. It's because he doesn't want to know it. I don't blame you for being good and saw, that dirty little snake. I know, but what do you expect? It's the cutthroat game we're in. It's every man for himself. Well, John, I'm about at the end of my rope. Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, the grievance committee meets, and once it gets before them, I can kiss my little career goodbye. No, you're crazy. We're going to fight. And we're going to get you out of it. What's the use talking that way, John? You know better. I haven't got a chance. I'm through and finished. Now, listen. Take my advice and get some sleep tonight. I guess you haven't been sleeping much, have you? No, not much. Well, that's what you need. A good sleep. Why don't you lie down and take a nap now? Huh? No, I've, I've, I've got to go down to the boat and say goodbye to my wife. Is there anything I can do? No, not a thing, John. Good night. Oh, Mr. Simon. Yeah? I forgot to tell you, Charlie McFadden wants to see you about something. Wait till tomorrow. You getting me a cab? Yes, sir, right away. Yeah. Excuse me, Chief. Can I see you for a minute? Not now, Charlie. I've got to go down to the boat, see Mr. Simon off. Well, I've got some news for you, Chief. I'm sorry. You've got some... What kind of news? It's about our friend across the way. Who, Baird? That's him. Let's have it. Come on, Charlie. Found out something about him? Well, I'll see you. Well, what is it? 
Well, Francis Clark there is leading a double life. What do you mean he's leading a double life? Well, wait till I tell you now, Chief. Remember me telling you I found out that he's always making business trips to Philadelphia? Yeah, well. Well, yesterday off he goes to the Pennsylvania station and boards a train for Philly with me right behind well. him. Well? He gets out of the station yeah. and hops a taxi for Germantown. Germantown. So I grabs another hack and tells the driver to find yes, him. Yes, go on. Well, we're going along great when all of a sudden we get into a traffic jam. And by the time it gets straightened out, we lose him. Well, is that all? Oh, Lord, no. That's just the beginning. I goes back to the station and hangs around, waiting to see if the other taxi's going to come back. Well, after waiting for about three hours, sure enough, back it comes. Was Dad in it? No, sir, he wasn't. Well, go on, go on. Well, I gets talking to the driver and asks him if he remembers. He says he does. He takes the same man out every week to visit his niece in Germantown on Sycamore Drive. Number 1217 it was. So, I drive out to 1217, and it's dark by now. So I look in the window, and there's a girl. A good looker she is, too. And there's a photograph of Baird over the mantelpiece. Was Baird there? No, sir, he was not. Oh, what is all this? What proof you got that he ever was there? Now, wait a minute, Chief. I ain't done yet. I says to myself... That little lady don't look like no niece to me. Is that what you call evidence? No, sir. Well, go on. Well, there's nothing to do till everybody's in bed. Then I goes back to 1217 and takes a look into the house. What do you mean? You, you, you broke into the house? Well, I wouldn't want to admit that, Chief. I'd be liable to arrest and imprisonment if I did. Are you crazy? What'd you do a thing like that for? Now, don't worry about me, Chief. It was an easy job, and I ain't so much out of practice as I thought I'd be. Well... I could find out. Well, I figured there'd be letters from him, and there was. You found letters from Bear to this woman? Yes, sir. A whole stack of them. Where are they? What do they say? They're right here, Chief. They're all about how much he loves her and adores her, and about how she don't have to worry about her future. <laughs> if you'll just lie low and keep her mouth shut. Dolly, you don't know what you've done for me. Well, it's oh. the least I could do, Chief, after all you've done for Rexy, me. Rexy, Rexy! Yes, yes, Mr. Simon. Get me Francis Clark Baird on the phone right away. Yes. Sir, give me a line. Rexy, I think we've got Mr. Francis Clark there, just about where we want him. And say, Rexy, take dictation. Yes, Mr. Simon. To my wife. Darling, darling, don't sail. Get right off the boat. Everything's going to be all right, and I'll be able to go with you in a few days. Phone me the instant you get this. All my love, sweetheart. <laughs> Tedesco, who's calling, please? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Tedesco's gone for the day. Simon and Tedesco. Simon, please. Uh, one moment, please. I'll give you a secretary. Oh, uh, Bessie, Mr. Simon's not to be disturbed. He's having an important conference with Mr. Francis Clark Baird. <laughs> yeah, if any calls come, I'll take them out here. Okay, Miss Gordon. Good evening, everybody. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Simon. Uh, Miss Gordon, is, is my son here yet? Well, there's somebody in there with him, and I think it's kind of important. Oh, won't you sit down? He won't be very long. It's all right. I'll wait. i got plenty time. How are you today, Miss Gordon? Oh, I'm all right, thanks. And you? Oh, I can't complain. You know, Miss Gordon, every time I come in the office here, I, I always think of the first place my Georgie was. Oh. Mm -hmm. Water Street. <laughs> Yeah, she was 13 years old. 13? She was an office boy already for Hirsch and Rosenthal. Mm hmm For four dollars a week. <laughs> oh, well. Uh... Yeah, four dollars a week he started. Yeah, and today he's the biggest lawyer in New York. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Miss Gordon, uh, he's feeling all right? He, uh... Yes, yeah, as far as I know now. Why? I don't know. Every day this week when he called me up, he sounded so blue. Oh, well, if there was anything wrong, he'd have told me. Yes, uh, Miss Baird, that'll be perfectly satisfactory. Now, after you. Thank you. Hello, Mama. What are you doing here? 
Hello, Georgie. Uh, Mr. Baird, I want you to meet my mother. Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Simon? How do you do? Uh, you, you know, Mr. Baird, she's a regular old shrew. If I don't behave myself, she comes after me with a rolling pin. Georgie, how, how can you talk such foolishness? I'm afraid I really must be going. Oh, must you? I'm, I'm very sorry. All right, Mr. Baird. Uh, thanks for coming in. Why, why don't you drop in someday and have lunch with me, Mr. Baird? Thank you very much. Good day, Mrs. Simon. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> That's my pal. Francis Clark Baird. He's one of the finest. Handsomest, blue blooded, <laughs> tough shirts I ever met. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter with you, Georgie? Nothing the matter with me. I'm just feeling good, that's all. Can't I feel good if oh, I want to? Oh, I'm glad you feel good, Georgie. I'm feeling fine, Mama. <laughs> I never felt so fine in my life. Say, how about a little dance? Come on, come on. Give us a dance. Georgie, are you so rich? <laughs> You're a fine dancer, you are. You have to give me a few lessons. Now, come on. Give me a lesson right now. <laughs> la da 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 Hello. 
I'd like to speak to Mr. Roy Darwin, please. He's out. Oh, is that so? He left for Europe. When did he sail? Six this evening. I see. Uh, hello. Do you have to know the boat he's sailing on? The Paris. Thank you. Matter of life and death. Oh, I can't. Tell him, Mr. Say, is that Wingdale himself? Yes, sir. Well, tell him. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I'll talk to him myself. Hello, Mr. Wingdale. This is George Simon speaking. Yeah, my secretary got me just as I was getting the elevator. What's the trouble? Oh, I see. Oh, is that so? Say, have the police been there? I see. Mr. Wingdale, have you made any statements? Oh, that's right. Don't say anything. I'll be right up. Goodbye. Wingdale's son had a fight with his wife this afternoon, shot her dead. Hello? Say, she was the richest girl in Texas. Can you imagine what a case like that's going to be? We've got to get right on the job. Oh, I'm ready. You're always ready, Reggie. That's one thing I can count on. What? Nothing, nothing. Come on, hurry. We'll grab a sandwich on the way up. <laughs> yes, Mr. Simon. Well, what are you waiting for? Not a thing, Mr. Simon. Come on. Do you, you don't need a hat. Come on. <laughs> yes, Mr. Simon. Say, Rexy. Yes, Mr. Simon. Rexy, I'm sorry I bought you off the sandwich. Oh, no, that's all right, Mr. Simon. Well, I'm... I'm sorry. Oh, for heaven's sake, Mr. Simon, let's get going. You have just heard Orson Welles in his own Campbell Playhouse production of Counselor at Law by Elmer Rice. In just a moment, Orson Welles will bring you his guest of the evening, Mr. Samuel S. Leibowitz, noted trial lawyer, and the leading players of tonight's cast, Aline McMahon and Gertrude Berg. But first, as I said a little while ago, you and your family can enjoy the good taste of chicken anytime just by serving Campbell's chicken soup. You see, it's made the good old-fashioned way. Campbell's chefs use all the meat of government-certified plump chickens. Then they simmer the broth long and slowly until it positively glistens with golden richness and delicious chicken flavor abounds in every spoonful. They add snowy rice and pieces of chicken. Chicken so tender it almost melts in your mouth. But after all, the proof is in the eating. So why not have it this weekend? Because just as sure as you like chicken, you'll like Campbell's chicken soup. Now, here is Orson Welles. And here is Mr. Leibowitz. Well, Orson, the jury requires no deliberation. <laughs> Mrs. Leibowitz and I have reached our decision. We find you guilty. Guilty of a good show in the first degree. Well, Sam, I won't appeal that. You know, this isn't the first lawyer I've played on the radio. Yes, I remember you used to be quite famous for your impersonations of me on news broadcasts. For a while there, I thought it was I. Sam, I'd like you to meet the accessories before the fact. Aline McMahon, please take the stand. Your witness, Mr. Leibowitz. Miss McMahon, I followed you on the stage and in the pictures. Well, oh, thanks, Mr. Leibowitz. I followed you in the headlines. And I'd like to tell you how much I've enjoyed your performance of Regina Gordon tonight. Is that the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help me. Call Gertrude Berg. 
Mrs. Berg, is it not true that during numerous 15-minute periods from Monday through Friday, you are known to millions of radio listeners as Mrs. Goldberg? Yes, Mr. Leibowitz. And is it not true that tonight is your first appearance outside that radio series? I must remind you, Gertrude Berg, that anything you say may be held against you. Yes, Mr. Leibowitz. And it's been so very pleasant working with Mr. Wells that I hope it won't be the last. I must caution the witness that it won't be if I can help it. And now, Orson, as to your performance as George Objection. Simon... As your legal advisor, Orson, I urge you not to object to what I'd like to say. Objection sustained. Such references are irrelevant, immaterial, and calculated to prejudice the radio audience. Thank you, Sam, anyway. And thanks, Aline and Mrs. Berg. Case dismissed. <laughs> next week, we're leaving offices and courtrooms and taking you out of doors and out to sea for a sea story, a true sea story, for all of the wild yarns that are spun about ships and sailors, the hardest to believe is the thoroughly authenticated adventures of the crew of the HMS Bounty and her master, Captain Bly. Nordoff and Hall have retold these adventures in three bestsellers. The name of the first of these was the name of a great movie. It is also the title of next week's broadcast. Until then, until Mutiny on the Bounty, until next Friday night, the Campbell Playhouse is obediently yours. Heard on tonight's program was Manhattan Serenade by Lewis Alter. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>